So, good evening, everyone. Um, my name's Elliot, as said. Uh, I think when we talk about mood disorders, and the most common one is depression, but I'll also talk a little bit about mania and hypomania. When we talk about them, I think we can pay attention a little bit more to how we understand our reasons to behave certain ways, particularly in the context of these mood disorders. So, I'll start telling you a story. When I was about 9 or 10 years old, I spent a summer holiday spending most hours every day playing this archaic, shall we say, computer game. Um, I enjoyed it well enough. It has lodged in my nostalgic memory in a, with a fondness perhaps in excess of how good it was. Uh, and I recall on one occasion my mother leaning over in the living room saying, Elliot, why do you spend so much time on that game? And I immediately thought I'd been rumbled. I'd been caught in some sort of indulgence that I really had to justify. So, well, um, it teaches strategy and diverse thinking and maybe history, which was nonsense, obviously. Its interpretation of history is creative, shall we say. Um, but realising I was in something of a blind panic, uh, my mum decided to throw me a rope and said, oh yes, but you also enjoy it, don't you? And it hadn't occurred to me that that was a fair enough answer. It hadn't occurred to me that just because I enjoyed it was a good reason for me spending my time on it. And I think there's something instructive in that thought. We sometimes miss if we're thinking about how should we spend our lives, especially as university students with so many different demands on our time and so many opportunities to better ourselves. All the time we think, I must be doing what is wise or what is virtuous. And we sometimes forget that a person has a reason to study and experience new things, but you as an individual person have a reason to read the poetry you're into or play the nostalgic, archaic video games you're into. These personal reasons apply to us as individuals compared to reasons that apply to people in general. And I think these are the reasons that govern how most of our free time is spent. And there was something I learned on that uh, afternoon when my mother told me, I'm allowed to waste my summer not going outside and enjoying the sunshine and instead spend it inside on the computer. And for the next summer and the next few years, I did what most people do, which is, without thinking about it, let these private personal reasons govern most of my free time, at the very least. But then, when I was around 15, I ran out of personal or private reasons to do anything. I lost interest in all the things that would have given me this sort of enjoyment that I felt particularly I should be doing, and so I spent a lot of time just pacing or walking from one place to another with no intention to go anywhere. And the reason was, I had run out of personal reasons. I just didn't have them anymore. And this lasted for quite a few months, and then it disappeared. And I thought, well, that was strange. And I put it out of my mind, and I continued with my life, with personal reasons having returned to me. A few years later, when I was maybe 17, it happened again. And it only lasted for a couple of months, and then faded. And then a couple of months later, it started again, and faded. And this got into a cycle. And this was a cycle where I would, every few months, lose any reason I saw for doing things I enjoyed. I didn't think I had a personal reason to see my friends, to get out of bed in the morning, or to work at all at school. And then when this faded, I didn't just go back to the way I was before. I was relieved. I was excited to have personal reasons again. So I responded to every reason I could think of. I took on every new task I could, committed myself to spend time on every conceivable project, and consequently committed myself to far too much, tired myself out, and made myself ill. Now, I wasn't sure what was happening here, but eventually one of my friends articulated that it seemed that my personality had changed in the last few years. I was now in base 8 or base 12, but I was never where I initially... My friend's a mathematician. This was a weird way of articulating himself. You'll have met them. They're interesting people. Um, I, I figured out... I had to probably establish why I was moving between base 8 and base 12. So I talked to a doctor and eventually got a diagnosis. My diagnosis is cyclothymia. This is a mood disorder that sits under the manic depression umbrella. Uh, consistently what was happening was I was having depressive episodes where I didn't feel I had a reason to do anything and all the other symptoms of depression came with that without me really having the insight to notice. And then I had hypomanic episodes where suddenly I was so excited and so impulsive and so obsessive that I responded to every reason I could think of to do any behaviour. Um, and I think these are quite common to a lot, of men, a lot of mood disorders. But the thing I'm interested in is how the change in your mood changes what you think your reasons to behave are. So in depression, what we see is all the evil little gremlins coming out telling you that your friends don't really like you, telling you that the projects you spend your time on 
aren't worthwhile, they're worthless, they're indulgences. And then, in the end, something called anhedonia sets in. Anhedonia refers to the inability to experience pleasure from things that used to be pleasurable. And that's very common. On the other side, you have manic and hypomanic episodes. And they change your responsiveness to reasons quite effectively. For instance, you might spend two months trying to teach yourself Icelandic instead of reading for your course essays in third year, Elliot. That's not a useful way of spending your time. But nonetheless, you do it. You do it. You do not learn Icelandic at the end, but you do it. Now, I, I'm interested in these for a couple of reasons. So what I think is going on here is not just a person not being motivated by their, by their reasons. I think when their perception of their reasons changes, something more important happens. And the reason I'm interested in this is because I'm a political philosopher by trade. This has implications for autonomy. Um, I wrote my last dissertation on that. I hope to write on this in the future. It's got implications for normativity, which is a big technical term for why you should do stuff. Um, there's a lot of human rights and medical ethics implications for this. And finally, if anyone would like to make a generous contribution to my research at some point, I will pass a hat round at the end of the evening. But I think what's up relevant to us today is looking at how this thought interacts with how we talk about recovery and how we talk about support. And one of the most common things people say when they're trying to support a person who's going through depression or mania or hypomania or indeed many other mental disorders is we hope that you can get back to your old self. I think this is perhaps an unhelpful way to think of it at times. So what strategies come into trying to get back to your old self? Some people rely on brute force. Simply think of as many fond memories, as many happy thoughts as you can, and attempt to drown the evil little gremlins. And there are some people for whom this works, and I am happy for them, and I hope it continues to work. It has never worked for me, and there are many others it has not worked for. The next one you might want to do is, when the evil little gremlins come, use what power you have over them to your advantage. You can't control what they say, but you can cast them in a voice. It was suggested to me by someone who has a very strong opinion on Donald Trump and said, if I cast them in the, in the voice of Donald Trump, they're not quite as dangerous anymore because I find that voice uniquely unpersuasive. And so whenever the gremlin says that I don't have any real friends and I'm indulging myself and wasting everyone's time, I just don't believe it quite as much. And again, if that works for you, continue. Good luck. Some people think of their depression or their mania as simply a group of symptoms to manage. And they rely on all their strategies to try and contain and control that symptom. And I think these are useful strategies for a certain group of people, and I wish them success uh, with them. But I think there's one more thing we can add that is helpful. Now, I started talking about your reasons to behave in certain ways. And a certain kind of reason comes from how you experience uh, the phenomenon, how you feel about sitting reading poetry, or spending hours and hours of your life working on a particular project. And if we take seriously the notion that that, your experience, gives you a special kind of reason to pursue that, I think we have to take seriously the question as to whether or not anhedonia or depression means we don't perceive ourselves to have reason, is this an error in our perception, or has it actually taken the reasons away? And I think knowing how we want to answer that can really help us think about how we go about recovery and how we go about supporting people uh, when they're in these states. So what I suggest is we embrace the transformation that comes with a lot of affective disorders. We acknowledge it for what it is, and it's not a person has forgotten the reasons they have to see their friends, to spend time with their family, to work on their projects, or to do their, their coursework, Elliot. It's late, you need to do your coursework, your essay is due in two weeks. I think what we want to do is acknowledge that the reasons have changed. The reasons that you see yourself having are the reasons you have when we're talking about these particular personal ones. It costs us something to be depressed, and what it costs is our justification for spending time getting up and going to class and spending time on our work. And I think that helps us answer questions. So how do we use this? I think when we're in recovery, there's a number of ways we can think about our recovery looking at these reasons. So firstly, listen to what the evil little gremlins say. They'll tell you your friends don't like you. They'll tell you that your projects are not worthwhile and that you're wasting your time and everyone else's. It doesn't mean you should trust them. It means you should listen to them. They will tell lies. They will always tell lies. It is what they do. But ask yourself, why are they telling this lie as opposed to another one? Why are they focusing on my relationship with my friends? And thinking through this in a lot of detail, and thinking slowly, and reflecting on what your mind is telling you, can give you some insights into how to, help, how to recover. So having done this for a few years with the help of a lot of excellent cognitive behavioral therapists, I'm now aware where my vulnerabilities are. 
I know which of my insecurities are the ones that depression or even mania can most effectively get at, the ones they can leverage to make me more and more depressed. And when I do feel my mood turning, I know exactly which insecurities I need to fortify. I know I should spend time seeing my friends. I know I need to plan next week's activities and define clearly what my metric of success and failure are for certain tasks so that I know next week I will see three friends over four days and I will achieve X number of things. And doing this gives me gratification exactly where I need it to stop depression getting control of me and stop the downward spiral. And interrupting it there is how I can now control my mood disorder much more effectively than I could a, a long time ago. And I think it's acknowledging my reasons for behaving different ways change when I'm depressed. And I have to respond to those changes if I'm going to try and make myself better. I think there's also something we can do when supporting other people. And I appreciate, I understand the motivation when someone you love or care about is depressed and, someone, and their behavior has changed to want them back the way they were. I fully sympathize with this and I've experienced it myself many times. But sometimes I think the desire to have the person back the way they were makes it harder to let them know that we're supporting them through their recovery. I think what we have to know is when the person cares less about spending time with you or cares less about projects that they used to value, just reminding them of how much they used to value it isn't enough. And sometimes that can make it worse. Sometimes the self-awareness I had that I'd lost interest, I'd lost the fire in my belly for whatever project I was working on, was painful. And that being pointed out to me only made it a little bit starker. So people who tried to remind me of times when I had been motivated, when I had cared about my projects, didn't make me feel better. It didn't give me this urge to go out and get better. It didn't give me a drive to recover. It made me wallow a little bit. And again, that's how it affected me. It will affect different people differently. But what I think we can all bear in mind when talking to friends, family, any loved one who's going through this, is that they're responding to a different set of reasons if they're in the midst of an e a mood episode. When the reflective episode is there, they don't have the same reasons that they used to. And so what I think we can all do is ask how you are feeling now and how do you want to feel in the future. And I was glad, at the very least, that I'd gone through this experience as long ago as I did, because quite recently a friend of mine went through something similar. And initially I did try to remind this person of what they used to care about, of all the reasons they used to feel they had to get up in the morning, go out and do something, and be productive. And it became very apparent very quickly that this wasn't making them feel any better and was having the exact same effect it had on me. It was making him feel worse, making him feel that he didn't have control over his mental states, and making him feel that there was nothing he could do to initiate his recovery. So what I did is, after noticing this, changed my tack, I asked him, what he wanted to feel like, anticipating that, like me, he wanted to feel like he had reason. He didn't want his old reasons back, he just wanted some reasons. And talking like that, I had managed to share my experience of going through depression as a transformative change. I didn't get all my old motivations back. I didn't have the same reasons to behave certain ways I did to begin with. But I got new ones, and I embraced that as a change. And I can acknowledge recovery as this transformative experience. And I think if we focus a lot of our conversation around that, around how the person who's feeling depressed, or indeed feeling manic or hypomanic, wants to feel about the future, I think we can talk more effectively, communicate with them better, and show that we can support them much more effectively. Now, there's a phrase from Dr. R. W. Shepard that has come reasonably well known in certain circles. And he says that if depression must be faced, you should learn something of the nature of the beast. You might be able to escape without a mauling. Putting aside the slightly more violent imagery than is perhaps ideal, I think there's something fundamentally true in this. If we are to manage our mental health, we need to understand mental health. But I think it's more important we understand it specifically with reference to ourselves and not just in the abstract. Learning about depression as such, learning about depression as it affects populations is useful. But to really control our, uh, control our moods, to really recover as effectively as possible, I think we should all be students of our own minds. I think we should learn what it costs us every time we have a mood episode, what it costs us to recover, and understanding why we're feeling the way we are gives us a far more effective way to recover. Thank you.